honest, I changed my talk today frantically because of my airplane flight last night, which was delayed and wondrous. I was flying over the United States with zero clouds, just looking upon cities, beautiful light lit cities in the blackness, just stunned by the beauty of this flight. And at the same time, my world has compressed so through social media. You'll see some of these compressions where I'm collaborating with people that I never met. So it was weird to see this giant city, and that became a theme of my lecture, which is my, my various airplane flights, including the crash that Dora wrote about. I'll start with that one. But um, I'm, I'm happy to see all these people. And a lot of them have, are former students and friends from college and sisters, even. <laughs> just one. But um, thanks for being here, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. I, I want to also say that I, remem I did not remember the encounter. What happened with Mark is he started commenting on my Facebook, and I thought, who is this funny, funny, funny man? I don't know if you know him well and if he is funny, but on Facebook, his posts were like genius, and I thought, I, I have to write to him. So I think I wrote to him and said, have me come and talk. And then he said, you were, I was your TA. And I vaguely remember just being sad that he was leaving. I think he only TA'd for a month, and I remember just being so sad that this, this young, cool guy was leaving. So here I am, and there are my books. Okay. I think I have to stay close to the mic. Is that true? I do. Okay. Then I will lower it. Um, okay, I thought that was a shadow, but it's a picture. This is a video of... See Yourself Sensing. This, is, um, this whole title originated in my class where my students do sense projects, and they're trying on one now. And I don't remember what this one did, but I really like it because that student could like make models in about two seconds when most people would take hours and hours and hours to model on the face. And um, I, as uh, I was departing and thinking about this this disappearance of dimensionality, I decided to call this expanding and contracting space, disappearing and reappearing. It has a little to do with the idea of seeing all these cities, but also, you know, Mark and I barely knowing each other. Lessons on airplanes. Sorry about using Helvetica. <laughs> I really am sorry. I just could not change the font. And my first airplane shot comes from another talk I gave, and it's a... Uh, all that's left of Amelia Earhart. I'm the sense person, and I think it's really weird talking about airplanes, and I find the hand of this woman who disappeared in flight but left this imprint. So that my, much of my talk is about the senses, and um, a lot of my talk really is, I'm not a scholar, I'm no longer super practicing, I am a licensed architect, but I'm really good at seeing things, and I'm old enough to have seen a lot of things and to think a lot. And I think that's the skill that you'll take away from this. I'm talking way too slow, though, so be ready. And I'm, oh, I can hold this, can't I? Can I? Oh, that would make me so much more relaxed. There. I have 450 slides to show you in like an hour. So to relax for a few minutes, and then I'm going to get really hyper and start spinning. Um, my first airplane ride, when I published See Yourself Sensing in 2011, my friend invited me to talk in Erie, and what's the um, big hub that you land in? Detroit. We landed in Detroit and had a big accident. So I call this beyond the body into space. We hit that bus there. That's my very bus, and my wing of my plane knocked it over, and it was pretty strange. It felt like we ran over a carpet. We were literally just touched down and knocked that bus Anyone on the left saw it. I didn't see it. I thought we just ran over a carpet. But um, nobody was in the bus, thank God. It's a big, massive thing. And there it is, knocked over. Well, and there's the tip of our plane. So I was going to talk about this project about the body and the senses. And I was thinking, like, how could a pilot, like, don't you know how wide your plane is? So I really wasn't frightened. I was like, this is great. I'm going to talk about this. Later, I was frightened when I realized if, if we were a little closer, the left half of the plane could have whipped off. 
And then I was like, I want my money back. Um, anyway, I was thinking as you go through this hub, you meet a lot of pilots. I won't go there yet. And I started asking them, do you feel the width of your plane? And the two young guys I met said, no, we use digital tools. But the guy that was retiring at about 65 said, yes, I can feel the width of my plane. So that started, um, that was the origin of the next book, which is about how your head expands into space. And I tried to ask every pilot I ever met, do you feel the width? And most of them say that now they rely on tools. And one, the last one was German and laughed at me like, you know, and asked me, why would I ask him questions? But that one that was 65 and on his way out, felt it. And so I, I made this drawing along with the help of somebody thinking that really, it's really the wrong thing. What's wrong with this picture? It's not really your arms that extend, it's your head. But it was easy to do it that way. And, and I think most of you have widened heads now. I, I've noticed lately I've become like sick with the iPhone. I, I've noticed my hand clutching for it when I'm driving. Like I'm not even thinking or wanting to make a call. So I feel too very extended. I, I did a lot of thinking about rear view mirrors. I like them a lot. I think you guys that drive a lot are very oriented around that width of the car and even wider. And that was pilot one and pilot two, like late 20s, and the kind of guy with the walrus mustache who said he, he felt more like this. The best I could do was mustaches. So I started to think, well, if, if you're really that wide and you have that mustache, then you, you really can't. I'm probably wrecking the video now, sorry. <laughs> but you have to go like this to get through here. Otherwise, you'll be blocked by your mustache. And so we'll look at a few of those. And if you you can um, cuddle up with your neighbor. And you're developing a lot of new senses and a lot of work, a lot of wax, a lot of pride. Sometimes they go up. This guy's the world winner of long hair, facial hair. You're probably, I hope you can relate to this in architecture. I, I am trained in architecture and a licensed architect. I think I um, sadistically made my lecture even weirder for you because often, I speak to art and technology, and they're already like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought I'd make it even weirder. So this isn't the weird part yet. Um, this is the guy extending super into space and celebrated for all of his wonder and maybe now connected to various animals or something. But he is extending. He's, it's not digital. It's physical. And who knows? Maybe it's an extension. But it does wrap up at night and make him look fierce. So in See Yourself X, I started to look at a lot of hair for a while. And I found this painter who, this is very weird. That's her son who, um, at a very young age, maybe like six or seven, started dressing in um, girls' clothing and having kind of princess fantasies. And the mother, I don't know if this is healthy or wonderful, the mother capitalized on it and began to represent him in these strange, luxurious paintings full of mythical creatures. Um, that's sort of a non sequitur. So I'll go back to, you can have snake-like protrusions in your um, active hair extension. And then I started doing simple little drawings that you architects know so well and do so much better than I do, but there's a little charm to my own rough sketching. Thinking about connecting your long mustache to things like trees or to the ground or to the tree again and, and what ways it would work and silly things like that and then thinking about spider webs that are, um, if you could, this is somebody who tries to control spiders and sort of deploy them. And then I tried to talk to robotics professors at Columbia and they were like, this is too much work, too much work. Can't do it, can't do what you want. And I, I was very impatient. So we started uh, doing some, uh, we, I, and my students, me and my students started doing some animation, um, thinking about whether hair could sweep around. I, I'm all the time thinking, I'm trying to connect the body to the architecture. I told you Dora did a better job of describing me. Um, and then continuing to physicalize it and make it structural so we're becoming architectonic, 
or extending parts of our bodies. There's a million little cute extensions of the ears and I'm finding a lot of them like not necessarily what I would on include in my books, but then it gets so tall that it almost gets fun and absurd. I'm thinking about the world's longest beard and how it's turning into a blanket. I'm, I'm really trying, in my life as an architect, I really felt um, devoid of connection to people. We were, we'd work on things for two years and it would get canceled and, and disappear. And then you're working on public spaces and you have no interaction. And I, I was tremendously bothered by the lack of, of narrative in the work I was doing. I think that's why I went into film and video and why I'm, I think what, when Dora wrote about me, she was talking about being more centered as humans have evolved and how we're getting more augmented. Architects really do have to look back. We need that person in the room, but we don't always have it. I, I, I have some little pet peeves about this field and one of them is that I don't think it keeps up as well as other fields with technology. It gets technological, it uses video, it uses things, but, and then there's these kind of conventional things like, oh, this wall shows the weather, or this shows pollution, and you've seen them over and over again. But I think we have so many skills as designers. What are you capable of? And my lecture, I think, is really, how do you step a little bit into the future? It's really hard to step into the future. I think it's hardest in this field of architecture because the faculty is, can be so much involved in what they're doing. You get so involved in other people, you don't put your foot into the future. So take a look at how I do. I just find weird things like this. This is the Smithsonian um, showing the world's longest beard that was found in an attic. I think it's the gentleman that we saw on the last one. The important thing is that the beard changes color. So things over time, just like trees and everything else, humans change with the light. And the darkest part is, of course, the closest to his body. Jumping, this is still the same plane crash. I'm going to go to plane crash two in a moment. Um, other people really do robotic things that are hair-like. And this is this woman, Anouk Whiprecht. I, um, she has pretty much been making these prosthetics that sort of wiggle around. I'm not sure what they do yet. If you look around, you can see a lot of robotics that are doing surgery. I'd, I'd like to see that, that you could be like lecturing and then the robotic things like tweaking away at something and not just flying around. Um, Mark, you can give me any kind of time warnings that you'd like. So in, in deference to women, I showed bearded women too. From this woman on the right is from the Circus Amok and you can run into her in New York City. And I think I just am trying to always open up my eyes to like things that maybe I find you know, whatever, grotesque, and then say, well, what's the big deal? We're all so inhibited. And then um, Marie, uh, Marina Abramovich started doing hair stuff so two people could connect, whether it's hair or architecture or some kind of prosthetic. And then we have animals that humans do terrible things to and then show with pride in some way. Again, look at that as a possible architectonic from an animal to a human. Um, this man, Michael Burton, in England, does weird things. He connects beards to small species and tries to help further our bacterial colony. So in the, in the future, when we are more riddled with diseases, we might be proactive by having a faraway bird give us the very bacteria that will keep us from getting ill. And so you will attract that by having a little creature, a cricket, in your beard. And then, I don't know what this guy's using, if it's wax or wire, but he's very bold to, to go both up and down at the same time. And Michael Burton and of Burton Nita, Michiko Nita, started doing body extensions that are feeding devices. This is an algae provider that is like an exoskeleton and a soft exoskeleton. And they made an opera out of this, believe it or not. Some people are, are really loopy. And this is another of their imaginings. So in what way can you take dopey, messy materials and envision the future? I think that's a really important thing for the health of this field. If the field is always looking back or imitating some person at the head, it doesn't seem to get anywhere. 
Um, Jan Fabra put a human with antlers. Of course, this is not really happening. A lot of these are just imagined. And I started some of those drawings connecting antlers and families of antlers and antlers that are buildings. And then we go to more architectonic Philip Beasley. I think he considers himself an architect. This is Hylozoic Grove. And those things have um, shape metal alloys that are looking like this in detail. And they, if you walk in, they all start veering at you. That's another question, like how weird should these things be? That's uncomfortable. But we, we then do these things digital. This is a group, this is called Anarchy. And uh, there's a lot of groups that are doing theatrical interventions with projection. Now that's getting hackneyed. Another thing is how quickly do things get to be old? Even my lecture now, I'm almost embarrassed about this. It should be video. But you can be surrounded by this and not have it touch you. So part of this airplane message is things, materiality is disappearing. And what are architects going to do about it? Along with the plane ride was this fellow who um, was the first one to put a computer into his hand. And he did a surgery that nobody really wanted to do. And to test this computer hand interface, he did it from the United States to London. And so you're looking at that map, but he didn't announce it because he worried that somebody could hack into him. And that's old, too, because this, he did this at least 15 years ago. Um, and now we have many types of devices that sort of begin to connect internally. But that's him lifting an egg with this um, surgical uh, chip put into him. Before he did that, he got wired up and he did some m menial things which would allow him to enter doorways without doing anything. And then he found surgeons. A lot of the people that I write about or look at have to do things in really weird ways. Like no surgeon wants to do things for the sake of art. That's not the Hippocratic Oath. But we, who decides? And if, interestingly enough, my best friend from college, his daughter, is going into robotic law. And I said, are, is this law about cyborgs, like the, the um, legal aspects of becoming part machine? And she said, yes. So somewhere along the line, someone will decide, as, as we are with CRISPR and all these techniques for deciding genetics. It's getting pretty weird. So this guy stuck this chip into himself, and there he is um, with this big arm thing. A lot of these things end up corroding. We don't, our body doesn't love when we put things into it. So that gets a little freaky. But while it was working, he could um, feel things into this port in his body, straight into his nervous system. Computer things would go into him. And then his wife, put, before she got one too and didn't like it at all, she got some necklace that would light up when he was excited or something, a little weird and silly. But um, that's, so they had some ethical issues. She did not like that he could sense her without talking because if we all had those, we could all sense each other. And that's going to be one of the ethical issues. This guy, I asked him, like, what happens when you start communicating brain to brain? And he thinks some of the senses will change but that will develop parameters. Like if I don't want to hear what Mark's thinking right now, I could do something in my mind. But I'm thinking it's going to get real busy and annoying. Plane two to Amsterdam. Uh, I get on the plane, and this just blew my mind. I don't know if it blows your mind. It's a Delft tile that is used to introduce the safety issues. This was like my airplane of weird culture stuff. And so here are the various things um, you should and shouldn't do. And um, it's a flat tile. A tile's flat. The screen is flat. The plane is dimensional, represented flat. And then it's the, the drawing is like out of a graphic novel. And I, I just found this like so weird. And the whole trip was weird about this whole Delftness. Like, what do we retain? as we go into the future. We, re we get everything flat and high tech, but it's still a Delft tile. It's so culture is so crazy. The culture of architecture is crazy. So, and at some points, there's this like dissolve. So you can't even tell what everything is. You're like, you're going to rely on this for safety, the Delft tile. OK, you're not going to make it. <laughs>
Anyway, so I'm, I, I did it again today. People think I'm weird on a plane. I, at the weirdest moment, I hustle to get my camera out like I'm seeing the greatest thing in the world. And I, I, often I miss it, but I, I was really pleased to get this um, and not have a plane crash on this trip. And, okay, exit. There we go. Exit the Delft tile. Um, this is the Delft tile. This is some fancy tourist trap in Amsterdam. I think these are fakes somehow. I don't know if the, the whole thing... They were a little weird, but that's what they're mocking up. And then one of the weirdest things on the plane, and I'm going way too slow, is the windmill on the cup with the airplane. Um, I'm, again, I'm, there's a theory of the future here. I don't know what it is exactly. I keep thinking, I brought this to my class, and I said, okay, everybody, we're going to take a urine sample. They were like, what the... F <laughs> anyway, but I thought it's so funny to have this, this airplane and the windmill and the color and the paper cup you might know better where I'm going. It made me want to do some Delft drawings of people growing mushrooms out of their head and heads out of their chest and little airplanes <laughs> in the hair. Okay, I get into my room in this hotel, Citizen M. I think, so how, who stayed in Citizen M hotels? They're like, you walk in and there's this uh, sort of sex kind of theme all over. The, at the elevator, there's windows, and inside, there's all these transgressions in the photograph. I'm looking around, and I get into my room, and the, you're not going to see this, but this, this is in my room by the bed, and it says, hello, citizen Madeline. And I thought, this is, what the hell? This is too weird. And then it said, always greet strangers as you would dearest friends. So the room was talking to me in a very annoying way. And in the lobby, oh, here's the room, ready? It's like right out of the Enterprise. And when you close the shower, it lights up. Everything's flush and flat and visible and, you know, I don't know. I was there by myself, so <laughs> I didn't see exactly how this is supposed to work. Um, and in the lobby, there are like jars full of things. So the, the whole thing is, so where are we going with this? That plane ride... Uh, I'm not sure. I think that I do gather this and bring it back into my teaching. This is not my books yet, and I'm, I better hurry up. Okay, so I leave there and go to England, and there's this place, the name of which I now, the, the Welcome Center, that always has kind of cutting-edge technology shows, and this is me in the fog. You're in a room, you can't see it all. I'm like all about this flatness, and then I get, you know, caught in a room full of fog, finding my way, the colors are changing. I'm not sure where this is adding up. Um, and then in the Welcome Center, there's a show about the human body, and they even have my book, which was nice. I was like looking at the show thinking, they better have my book, because this is like, and they did it, but that doesn't always happen. And um, so there were, there were weird dentist racks and lovely glass organs. So we're back in this dimensionality, but it's not real dimensionality. It's this fake stuff. Now we've corrupted the word fake, which is, so I'll have to come up with um, something else. But that's related, too. In a way, it, everything's hybridizing, flatness and depth, digital and real. It's been happening for years, but it's happening for me in the weirdest spots, and that has to do with the airplane last night. But before I leave the plane, I collect everybody's little boxes and cups and bring them back to my class. And I think, let's, we're about to do a project with the la laser cutter, the lazy cutter. So I undo the box, and it's pretty cool looking. And we go on. And so even when I'm doing something like laser cutting, I do it experimentally. So the, the drawing over there is just a random pattern. And once that random pattern is produced, you, you draw it, you get it laser cut, and then you see, whoops, what, what it can do. And you fold it up, and then you iterate it. So these are some examples of what that led to. Now I diverge into just random things that a Luna moth landed on my window and a weird flat thing. Can anybody identify that? I'm guessing it's from a sneaker. Like, it's bigger. It's about this big. I'm just thinking like the weird stuff of the world, the natural world and the garbage on the street is blending. And then there's, you know, shoes are flattening and, and getting designy and weird. And then on TV, you see the good old things that never change, the Thanksgiving parade and Snoopy's physical, but you never see it. You're never there anymore. You always watch it on television. There is this weird thing, like, about reality. One thing that's real is our hair, and there's a lot of thoughts about that in See Yourself X. So when I'm walking down the street, though this is a bit of a leap, 
I stop people and say, can I take a picture of that? Because it's this um, reusable thing, right? There's people now using hair for making things. It never stops growing, even after you die. And there's a lot of it. And it's, it's pretty sought after and very expensive. OK, Airplane 3, the trip to San Francisco. I'm curating objects of wonder. Um, I write an article way in advance about turbulence. Heis Heisenberg, um, we have a physicist here. Carl, do you know what Heisenberg said? One of his big questions that he would ask God. <laughs> One of them of the two was, I would ask God, it, it might be apocryphal, what is turbulence? Does that make sense, Carl? Yeah, so turbulence, you know, the thing that when your airplane lifts gets, if you look at it in a certain way, you can see all of the swirling or in your coffee cup like this, which is an endlessly vortexing coffee cup by a guy named Anthony Hall that was in the show. I back up to say that uh, the day, like two days before the show opened, I knew we had little work and I designed a Fibonacci table, which I feel should be produced. It was really fun to have people help you and like, I do this and then they go and cut it. I, I, I would love if anybody can just give me a studio with like 10 people and all kinds of machines and I just boss them around. I would be so good at that. But um, I, I, more turbulence. There was a guy who took all the explosions from movies and made a movie of the explosions from movie and a guy who made beautiful architectonic poor picture of a beautiful perspective of butterflies. And then I walk into the next room and I see this. So I thought uh, it was a show about artists from the 60s. So the other thing is that once you start looking at something, you see it all over. And it means something. You, you, you should address it. And where I love turbulence and, and curve it, curling is from this manga, um, Uzumaki. Does anybody know it? A Japanese um, by Junji Ito. And, it, and this is the bitchy girl from high school in a town that gets infected by the vortex. So there's no monster, it's just vortexing. And she starts to grow like four-story spiraling hair and like this lunacy and there's weird snail humans climbing up the wall. I try to show it to my students a lot and they get freaked out. So I, I give them a lot of advance warning. Here's my, we're coming to my book soon and now I'm on the plane. This is this a space and media, a crisis in three dimensionality. That's what I'm thinking about. So the plane takes off and we're, uh, this is out of order. This is me photographing the cities below. I, I was zoomed in and I thought that's just so neat. And then I couldn't believe it just to prove to you that's New York and San Francisco. I mean, look, look at how clear Manhattan is. It's, it's like you never see that. You see the subway map and it's distorted and then you see this from above. I don't know why, it's just, maybe it's not so shattering to you and you see this all the time, but I have flown over the city so many times and I was just stunned to see it that way and felt very small and very weird, but also happy. So that's the wing. I had a really good view of the little wing. And here comes the safety. This is when I was, my mind was blown, the safety video. I, I don't know if you've seen this and if it blows your mind too, here it comes. There's two of them, and then we'll talk about it. In the event of an evacuation, escape path lighting will appear. Follow the lights until you've reached your exit. Leave all carry-ons behind. Just head quickly and safely to the nearest exit. So we have Cyborg helping us out of the airplane now. Now, if the airplane loses pressure, oxygen masks... But you can't really see it in this light, so I'm going to go on to the next one. Oh, but first I thought, okay, Orson Welles, right? This is, what's this movie called again? where the, the mirror scene. So you'd be foolish to fire that gun. With these mirrors, it's difficult to tell. You are aiming at me, aren't you? I'm aiming at you, lover. Of course, killing you is killing myself. It's the same thing. This is the 40s. But you know, I'm pretty tired of both of us. <laughs> little violence. Now we go back to this and see, what is that movie named suddenly? I've forgotten. Do you know? The what? No, no, it's not the third man. No. All right, we'll Google it later. But um, I was like, okay, this is cinema. It's not about the airplane. And I want you to watch this. I hope you can see the background because I really believe this is the essence 
of architecture that it's like, in, it's flattening and it's disappearing here in this video and there is no airplane, the airplane is fake. I, I don't know, I just can't believe that, but the airplane isn't fake, I'm sure. Put the vest over your head, wrap the strap around your waist, attach the buckle and pull tight. Once outside, pull the tab to inflate your vest or blow into the red tube on the side. Okay, chaos. Water, a light on your vest will illuminate. And please, only inflate your vest outside the airplane. And they're all like if models. Necessary, an infant life vest will be distributed by a flight attendant. The safety card shows how to use it. Oh, we need the card still. We the have to read. The crew will now be coming around to do a final cabin check. After takeoff, we'll be back with more information. And if you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. As always, we're here to make your flight great. Because great is what we're going for. Now it's like that group that makes those weird Rube Goldbergs, that music group. Yeah, we go. Okay, go. We go. Yeah, so, so I don't know. Does, does it make you care about how you get out anymore? I don't, I'm trying to decide, but I do think you're in a physical plane, you're flying through the air, and the plane is gone. Weirdness. So I'm getting to my books. This reminded me of people that believe the world is flat and the proliferation of that. You know about that, right? I met one by chance. They're completely convinced the world is flat, and, and that is from their, one of the pictures from their group. And then you can take an egg and make it flat. Now I'm really free associating for a moment, so just relax. So do it yourself, crushing an egg by putting some chemical on it. We, that sounds fun. But even our documentation that we believe, this is just a Google map, and there's something that goes wrong with Google Maps and long bridges and things, and that's what our world looks like. So we believe it when we're looking at the street, but all of a sudden it's creepy and bending. Then there's a guy who makes that the source of his art. Now I'm really free associating. See yourself. That's my eyeball in the doctor's office. I, I'm like rushing to get the camera out again. I almost feel embarrassed about sharing that. It's so personal. Um, things we do for love, like Cor do we do corsets for love or for other things? I don't know, but I put that down. So that's what your anatomy looks like. These are all the, I'm on this riff about distortion, things you really distort, things that don't exist, that are real, like, like this. What's his name? Homer. Homer has an MRI or an x-ray and a little teeny brain. I, I'm going to believe that's real in some way. At some point, everything's collapsing. My student at Parsons who's talking with on cleansing devices, <laughs> he's very funny. And then real science, I mean, you know, we are influenced by and people that are looking at the future. This is a woman named Catherine Fleming that I curated in Objects of Wonder and The Current Show who thinks that we will have to engineer animals not only to preserve them, but also as we preserve them, they'll be to our own delight. They'll be smaller, they'll be, you know, we love antlers, so let's make them really funky. And this might have to do with architecture too, like what way will we augment something, like even the toilets or the sink? Maybe that's the wave. And she's in my new show with a bare hibernation station for your home. And I hope we all have one. I wanted to prove to you that the planes are not flat and disappearing. That's one under construction. And then I thought in my riff here, my favorite artist is this guy, Christophe Fuchel. I went to an installation of his that was crazy, and he's proposed to bury a jet into the desert as an art exhibit. So then I riffed to things underground, buried stuff. Lunar quarters, and this is really bizarre. This is a, did you want to take a picture? Okay. This is, um, you can test what it's like to be in a casket. Um, grim, but doable. Not sure how you get out, and I would not want anyone to stuff something in that little pipe. Looking on your way to commute at cool things and our possibilities for architecture like this on that, here's another trip. This is the airplane trip when I gave a talk last November in LA, and I found that seed pod, and of course I was thinking of the South American, Brazilian, named, I'm testing you, Oscar Niemeyer, like, I think if you just, if you want to do something fun, take a day off and go find seed pods and just look at them. How, how could that be? And then how people move around, all these crazy racks in LA for all their rolling devices and the physicist 
who was from Italy next to me, had this little um, I'm, I want to say armillary sphere, but it's not. It's a sundial. So here comes the cutting edge physicist wearing the old thing. And oh, and people get married in this in LA. I, am I too free associating? And then students get to write on boards that are translucent on the roof of this gorgeous building. And here he is um, doing his homework with plugged in flat again, but this time translucent. Other things I like are just wayfinding. This is a Native American tree, they, and that's the diagram of how they formed it. They'd shove things in it to make it turn, and then instead of the Appalachian tra trail mark, you find the bent tree, and it would tell you which way to go, and they still exist. I thought I saw one, but I don't know. Um, things from childhood, Dr. Doolittle is a big influence, the old one, giant snail shells that you inhabit, and then, you know, whatever, architecture in Mexico or wherever weird place they build full snails. And st lastly, things you can, can do with your friend, like touch eyelashes. I know, a lot of people, I'm going to go away from that for a minute. When I show, there's about five things that make people sick. And I, I often wonder about that. It's just because you're not used to it. It doesn't make me sick anymore. And it's not that gross. It's just, I don't know. We just don't do certain things. Okay, student work, where the books come from. How am I doing for time? How are we doing? Good? Okay, we're not even at the books. Here we go. This is the stuff I do where the books come from. You'll see how I teach. I have to say a lot of my career I've been sort of like seen as the outlier or the weirdo maybe like 25 years ago or had to work really hard to be accepted in the kind of academy like do everything everybody said but do my weird stuff on my own. And lately I don't care. I just do what I do. And I don't think you can do that at every step of the way. You do it in secret but you should do it. And you should secretly like rebel against those teachers that are so demanding of you to see something a certain way, even if it's just in a notebook. So my rebellion a little bit was to do these sense-based projects. It seemed to me if you're going to take a sophomore in college and have them do an architecture project, they ought to understand how the senses work. And Chanot here is one of my students, and Jacqueline, they're here. Chanot did a see yourself sensing project. So. In that, you'd usually do some kind of performance. You'd have a minute to go in this thing, and if you happened to pretend that your eyes were at the end of your hand, then you had to do a lot of research and produce a drawing like this and find something that validated it. And of course, um, if you look in the books, you see snails have eyeballs in the spot where we do, but they're really at the end of these things. And this is what the student would then produce, and it would have to, whoops, work and function and here's another one. It's easy to say I'm going to make a periscope thing and see through my hand. But this guy, Ryan, who is now a big robotics guy, which is funny because he brought um, robotics into this class. He's got a real a button that's moving that mirror periscope. And like, can, you, can you help him turn sideways, somebody? Sorry about me. And then here's this one. So this is how he's that's changing the view. Actually, if I back up, I'm getting all chipboard. Can you be quiet for a second? Oh. I want to get... Sorry, that's... Yeah, I'm annoying. Okay, then students do things like dip their hands in paint and look at either pain sensitivity or what is the three-dimensionality and make projects. Now I'm going to show you a whole bunch of hand and head projects. So that was this guy's hand project. And here's a, a not entirely successful conceptually, but fun thing to watch how he extends out into space. Um, and another student who was looking at the sensitivity of the hand and then went to the face. And on the left, it, it represents your sensitivity graphically. And on the right, you feel it and try to match that with those little things. You'll see her in video. There's the student we saw before with this headpiece, eyelashes that have you know cranks. And are you here, Caroline? Nope, she was supposed to come today. This student um, making a very, an eye prosthetic. This changes your cone of vision. And here's a little video of these. This one that's going to come on is very, very sharp. It's, if you move your mouth one way, it says I. If you move it another, it says we. And it, it ha that all has to do with your senses. I no longer remember exactly how, but watch a bunch of these. These are usually sophomores in college going into architecture.
Okay, more, more using Lego motors. I look like a torturer, but they, they do this will, willingly. And here goes, yeah. this is Should about the up? sequence mm -hmm. of the senses. Mm -hmm. Get Press ready to watch the, the nose. Please don't go down on us. Okay, ow. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling open Are you okay? nostrils. <laughs> no, I'm like lost. And these people go on to be successful architects, and I, I don't know if I've helped them. This guy is graduating from Harvard now. He's a very, very bright guy. And he had, I always joke, he had like ordered all these chemicals and looked like he had a crystal meth studio, but he's very refined. He's like the head of the debate team, and he speaks with like a beautiful accent. And he did aftertaste and after image. I think this is going to come up in video in a moment. This is a more simple, direct um, relationship. Here he goes. So the CO2 would change the color, and then, and that would have to do with the light, the length of time he's seeing, seeing an after image. If I can get people to experiment with chemicals in my architecture studio, I'm happy, and as long as they're safe. And then, of course, there, there's structure involved in everything. This woman was an engineer in New Arduino, so inside of there, things are moving. Again, in a, some kind of sequence of the senses, but they're both crude and beautiful. And they have to look like something. Everybody in architecture makes a track at some point. Here, you, here we are seeing ourselves sensing. This is Ed. He's like one of my oldest students, and he passed away last year, but very sad. He was so playful and fun, and that was his head project. Okay, zipping along, students using condoms to make models, and there's Ed again. This is another Ed. Looking at aspects of breath. And, and even, I must say that when I see Ed and I know that he's no longer with us, it's, it's sad, like, um, all of these efforts we make, we know, you know, not to be on the dark side, but you, you gotta work hard, and it means nothing, and it means something, all the things you do. At the dentist, I find things, and I, I love looking at the tongue for the architecture students in the Sear self-sensing projects. The tongue is so damn weird. It's like giant and, and strong. And this is a student doing a project related to the tongue, and here's another one. That's her amazing, amazing unit that goes in and out, and here's her. It, it's not actually totally functional um, as it connects to the mouth, but the movement of it is completely robotic. What a great thing, just as a project, to make a unit that allows something to move fluidly. And of course, it was everybody's laughing their head off because it's embarrassing. Um, I don't know. There's applications to these we don't even know of. That whether it's self-protection in the subway if you're pregnant, maybe you need like an extra level. I, I had twins, so I was like, you know, wider than that at its widest extension. Um, in a simple Freshman class, students make suitcases, and this is one student that opens up. They had to have like engagement with the public, and here's some little pieces. And then things for the hand you're about to see, and that's one that turned into a structure, but I'll move on quickly. Things for the torso, all student work. I'm into vegetables right now in my architecture studio. I call it vegetecture, and this is a carved one. And then they start to move into weird plaster things and there's an onion, but I didn't show you a lot of these. Now I'm gonna whip through the hands. I've been putting a lot of these on Instagram. We use our hands for weird things and flat things like maps, and my students might uh, study, uh, do an analysis, and then create some weird path that is very unexpected, but all about the movement of the hand in and out to generate your structure. You know everybody in architecture, we're always dealing with undermining the grid. Well, so the body is marvelous for that, and so are gloves. A dissecting things, not animals, but products for the sake of architecture. Uh, acts of originality, like taking the thumb off a plaster model is suddenly shattering. We look at the thumb like we've never seen it before. Found hands, hands in my class uh, modeled after things people find on the web. Lovely little motion applications, or just 
in architecture, if you can do this with the hand, if you can see the pinky as such a freak show, you can do this in architecture too. In what way can we show things in new, anew? Um, and these are even like your little glue things you did as a child are important. This guy, David, did a wonderful model for the hand, a little umbrella. If I had time, I would tell you that there's conceptual stuff behind all of these. But you can probably see that there's a lot of structural complexity and a very kind of organized conceptual DNA. That's the assistant on See Yourself X. She's now a graduate student. She, she got into interaction design programs. Everything you can name, she got accepted to with her wonderful work. The first and only student that dealt with nursing in my class as a sophomore. Like, who thinks about nursing? when you're a sophomore, and there it is, like an Oscar Schlemmer project. More hands. This is funny. We write on hands power cord, but we also use them to interact with the computer. So I think there's a kind of smushing of things in this entire lecture. Utensils and found, found nature or pens. More student work. Details. Again, the thumb or the finger looking different. That's the same student that did that nursing project hands that are, are disappearing and analyzed for all of these different sensory components with light, positive and negative space. My daughters sent a package, and when I got it, there was this hand sticking out of it just by chance, and it's like, perfect. Okay, we're getting to the books. How much time? How, yeah, taken 44 minutes so far? All right, good. So I got asked, based one nice thing about the flatness of the world, if you'd call it that, or the digital thing is, through Facebook or whatever, people ask me to do things. And they asked me to curate at Pratt Manhattan Gallery. And I said, yes, I'm not loving curating because I don't want to turn into a curator. I want to be a maker. But it's nice to show other people's work that you like. So I, I do it. But I did something devious. I curated myself into this show so that I would be a maker again. And I'm really deeply excited about what I'm making. And so I'll just tell you that um, I had a fan on See Yourself Sensing and his name is Andrew Quitmeyer, and occasionally I saw he liked so much stuff, I'd look him up and think, oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, he friended my personal site, and then we started chatting and became friends, and he is so creative and weird. He is, calls himself a digital naturalist, and he's a hacker in nature. So I got asked to do this show. I thought I'll ask him to, to um, do a piece with me. And he said yes, and it, it is hysterical. He lives on the opposite end of the world. We met once, and then we are like doing things. So here comes what we're doing. But before that, these are some works in the show. I think See Yourself Exist is about the future of humans and nature. You get people that are like, you know, humans made of like spaghetti and disruptive faces. A woman who makes pieces out of the thing that she fears, bugs. I think this has tremendous applications in architecture, like what are the shapes we use and how do we find them? Um, kind of one-liners that are very lovely too, though, shoes that are full of teeth as though in the future, like your shoes can come and nibble on you at night. Um, this is a piece called um, Connected Colors. And so another application for architecture would be obviously face tracking and that everything is just a blank slate. This is very expensive technology. Super fast, multiple image. He said it would cost like a million dollars to bring to the gallery. So I'm projecting. Unlike Dory Hugh, who had the bug faces now, you just simply project those bug faces. Okay, this is a laundry room anyway. Here comes the thing, uh, the collaboration. Um, Andy and I, I had this idea that I wanted to do something with dry cleaning conveyors. And it sounds like they're big and hard to find, but I spent my summer finding dry clean conveyors. And right in a town that I go to often was a defunct dry cleaner, and this is it. And I'm making a little video as I'm talking of the light in this sad old place. And there, believe it or not, I found two conveyors. Each of them was 10 feet long. Beautiful machines. They're like 40 years old, but they work like a dream when you plug them in. 
and they have little things on them that can come off. So what I started to do was Andy and I decided that in the future, you'd almost have to collect samples of nature. You won't really necessarily have the same leaves. Uh, if you look at the experts, they're like collecting plants because we talk a lot about animals are going extinct, but plants are going extinct too. And I don't want you to leave depressed after this lecture. I feel very positive about this stuff. I don't think it's all dark. I think it's actually like making an effort to make things work. If, okay, if, we're, if our country's not joining the Paris Treaty and like our, our ecology programs are just a mess, at least let's do something about it. Well, I don't know if Andy and I are exactly doing it, but we've been casting resin, talk about toxic, and there's a picture of him casting a um, high speed. It's labor intensive, almost like knitting or something. It's very meditative and casting out in real nature so you don't have to kill the plants. And this is what the stuff we have looks like. It's these beautiful resin leaves and they have glow powder in them. So just two days ago before I was leaving, they also look like lungs. We, um, I had a photographer come over. These are all cast sunflowers and pieces of wood. That's how transparent they are. That's me having fun, being a bug. They're giant, and this is my, my loot so far. I need to make like 200 more. It's not cheap either, but it's, it's really so neat. And all of those glow, so this is what they look like. I'm going to show you Andy's. He's got jungle leaves. Okay, this is what they look like lit up. And this is going around on the dry cleaning conveyor, two of them, and you're in the middle. I don't know if this is uh, acceptable that I'm showing you this. Why not? Let me see if I can show you Andy's. It's on YouTube somewhere out of this. I'll show it at the very end. Okay, the books. See Yourself Sensing. Here's five pages from See Yourself Sensing. These are humans that are augmented by robots, including this one I like a lot, the third arm. It works from your stomach muscles. And I don't know why he's, is he writing backward? That's the one question I have. He's clearly writing on glass. So wouldn't evolution be backward? But maybe for the picture, he faked it. And then there's more like home done things and augmenting of sound. And this is images from See Yourself X. These are almost look like fashion images and some of them are to me, there really might be a future in human uh, fungi hybrids. And then I go back to the hair rolls of the 18th century, and those are pretty amazing. They change scale, and you could have like whole battles envisioned on them. And I'm thinking about the scale of the head, and other people have like animals in their head, and maybe we would have benefits from some kind of animal hiding out in there. I'm not going to go over this too much. Just this is kind of what I already showed you, like things I do, practice being conscious, like conscious of noticing things. I talk to strangers in a project I'll show you. I look across disciplines. That might be a, my other great skill is I'm not strictly in architecture. If you are, how many of you are in architecture here in the room, like strictly architecture? So what are the rest of you, art? Anyone in art? Anyone in science? <laughs> What, what about the middle there? Interior? What's something that I didn't say? What? Student in, what do you study? Oh, you are. Yes, that's what I meant. How many of you are studying architecture? Okay, so my thought is just make sure you do something else, like look at beetles or something. Find something else that's feeding, even just reading. Um, now, before I get to actual work in the book, I'm going to give you a set of slides about how I undermine what is the truth. And this is happening in the world with, of course, fake news, but um, I'm going to, the first set of things is I say don't believe everything you, th you think. So in this case, from Dr. Doolittle, the snail has eyeballs, but we've already discussed the fact that the eyeballs are at the end of those little horns. So. The world is not exactly what we're told or what we believe. And then, do you believe everything you think? Like, could you, could you make a project where you want a kid to have eyeballs and do a painting and do a project like that? Or might we have such long lashes that we connect to the wall? Um, these are just some artist, Maurizio Anzari's um, sewing project. Some of you that like to sew, I think that has applications in architecture work. 
why would we, we ever rely on the senses? So in this sense, I say, well, what could we look like? Why do we stay so fixed with our apertures and, and our parts? Why couldn't they just be moved around? And this is a, a game from the 50s called Phyzog, P-H-Y, Phyzog. Um, this is an artist named Jaime Pidark. He's in that show, See Yourself uh, Exist. And this always makes me think about what your brain looks like. So if you change the eyeglasses, the brain... Well, by the way, I don't know what holds this up because you don't have a nose. Another artist, Lorenzo Ogiano, believes more in the post-human scenario that we won't be bodies at all. We're just kind of kinetic, body-ish stuff. And as a way of getting toward that, he started to take off the eyeballs and stomachs and separate them. But, you know, you can go back as early as the 18th century, Prince, uh, Prince of Wales, George IV, exchanged these tokens of love with the Catholic widow, um, Maria Fitzherbert, and so began a Victorian thing, a tradition of giving your lover your eye. So it's not like this is, a, you know, coming out of nowhere. How weird are these eyeballs? They're, they're freaky. Anne Hamilton made a pinhole camera for the mouth. This is all work in see yourself sensing and started getting these pictures like this that are eyeball-like, but you're looking out at them. And then Stellark, the performance artist from Australia, swallowed a stomach sculpture, very dangerous. It would light up with bells and whistles. He does weird things with the body. But now we have sensors because our old people can't see doctors anymore. So they're all alone, but we're all excited because they're going to be taken care of remotely, which I don't think is such a great thing, but at least we'll know that their pill dissolved because the sensor will tell when the pill has dissolved in your stomach remotely to the nurse's station. And while they're looking at the television, they won't see <laughs> that it didn't really dissolve. We'll see. Hopefully they, they're good. I think my sister Sabrina watched this as many times as I did. Have you seen the original Fantastic Voyage? Because like, I think that was very inspirational to me. It was a bunch of people that went into the body of somebody to save them. And I must have seen it a hundred times. And it affects you eventually when you're going through the organs. So I looked at this poster. I think it was for a Swiss music group. And they have a person with the nostril has a horn inside. And I'm always, you're looking at this like, haha, it's cute. And when I see these, I'm like, this is incredible. And, th you know, there's that person from like the 18th century, very famous, I can't remember his name, you probably remember it, who put all kinds of cones into buildings for listening devices. If anyone knows his name, yell it out. Augmentation we know. Well, we know that this artist, Orlan, made horns surgically. Lady Gaga supposedly did, but just saw Orlan and did it herself. Um, cochlear implants are amazing. Artificial hearts. So we, we have plenty of cyborgian already. What we don't know, I'm interested in. So I like this Jan Fabre installation. And this is how I imagine myself and many of us that we're like buried and just learning a bit. We're uncovering ourselves. So I, I wrote a little bit about this person who had a stroke and believed um, he, was, he, he believed that reports of his paralysis were a myth. So we can also have things like agnosognosia in where the brain tells us that we're perfectly fine, but we're actually paralyzed. So the body is incredibly mysterious. Things we pretend to know. We pretend to know the eyeball. We pretend to know the world. Um, and we, here comes a gross one. Ready? And then we explore uh, things that we maybe don't know, like things we've never done. Now, Art is funny. This is Janine Antoni, her husband licking her eyeball. I would do it. I'd have no problem with it. And then Maurizio Catalan comes along and makes a joke of that. So that is, to me, so funny. One is the real tongue licking the eyeball, and then the an eyeball in a mouth looking at the eyeball. So artists also make fun of themselves. Uh, and then uh, this is a map of the 1960s internet so that you realize you know, where you're coming from and how weird the world is. Stellark again, who put an ear on his arm. It's now defunct. It was working. It was connecting him to the internet, but it underwent necrosis. Also projects, again, and see yourself sensing. This is Lawrence Malstoff crushed in a tiny environment that he says is equivalent to a hug. But at my book launch, everybody stared at him in terror, like 
thinking he was suffocating. And there he is in this shrink wrap situation. So I think what I'm looking at is alternate environments, alternate ways that the body experiences things, sometimes terrifying ones like the next shot. In the next shot, you're going to see delusions of self-immolation where a machine sets you on fire for like a quarter of a second and then distingu extinguishes you. And you might find that grotesque, but I think it's interesting. We, we pretend to know how people feel in dire circumstances like in Afghanistan when you're 12 years old and getting forced to marry somebody where so many girls do self-immolate and so many survive maimed. But this is like this weird project where you know the middle class can try it too. I don't know what to say about that exactly. Here it is, and there's the dis extinguishing. That's another image of the hair rolls. So in terms of these environments in the body, maybe there can be changes in scale. This is Matthew Darley. Next title says, we blend and disappear. So might we hybridize, as I've said, with fungi? Um, we can disappear altogether and be ro robots. This is Louis-Philippe Demers. And you walk into a room, and this thing looks at you. It's sensing you through the nose, and the eyes move. And you might know this, the uncanny valley is the thing that you experience when you go to a thing like this. You love it, everything's great, and then you get completely creeped out at the realness of this fake humanness. The realness that's wrong. So one of the things we look at in all robotics is once it gets really close to being human, something's wrong, but it's tiny. And when you perceive that, you actually get sick. Um, this is Inferno by the same artist, Louis Philippe Demers. In this project, you no longer move your body yourself. It's like a, a DJ bodies. It's all kind of dark looking, but I mean it to have some kind of levity. So you have zero agency. The robots are moving you. Okay, we won't look at that too long. Unreliable. So are we a person with a little man and in there moving a projector? Or are we a brain with 800 little people enacting things? Or are we like the sensory homunculus, which we never perceive ourselves like, but the fact that our lips and tongue are so much more sensitive than our little body? Our, our knees are like shrunken, even genitals in comparison to the hand and the lips. So when you walk out of here, maybe just rethink your body. Unreliable, unreliable because we like someone for the way they look or act, but we learn that it's a lot about smell, the sweaty t-shirt test. They had women smell, uh, if essentially you're smelling uh, a man's underarm through these devices, and what they found out is they liked people that smelled different from them. And that was this gene, the, um, I don't know, the MHG or MCG gene, and that is all about having healthy offspring. So think about your mate, look over at your mate right now and say, huh, was it all about smell? And a guy designed, James Auger designed a dating device. That's a wall. They don't see each other. They just have connections to the, the apocrine glands where your smell comes out. And you decide in advance if you want to date someone via smell. So again, your, your romance might be unreliable. Another unreliable is where the body begins and ends. We, we know that we have kind of empathy with football players that get smushed. And we know by the rubber hand test, which is that there's a rubber hand and you begin to make your real hand disappear and you begin to feel things through the stimulation of the rubber hand. Peter Campus, an early video maker, started playing with that when he did these video projects where you see yourself projected in two ways from two different cameras. And this is my favorite unreliable. This is the um, uh, Gazaniga project with people with split corpus callosums. And I can never fully explain this. With a split corpus callosum, you have no connection between the sides of the brain. The right eye is looking at the snowy picture of the house, and the left eye is looking at the chicken. And when they ask the man, he picks up cards, and he picks up the shovel and the chicken. And the logic, you'd think, is that the shovel's good for the snow, and the chicken is related to the chicken leg. But he says, you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. And the snowy picture is undermined by some fabrication of the brain. And they believe that 
that is at work with witnesses, that you can't rely on witnesses because the left brain lords it over the right brain. And the way it lords it over, which I don't have time to explain exactly, it's like this. If the left brain here doesn't see anything, and the right brain is controlling the ball, but the left brain can't say it has the ball. The right brain can touch it. And this is, again, with these split corpus callosums, but it's worth your thinking of your own unreliability for a little while. Ma Margaret Thatcher teaches us unreliability. There's Margaret Thatcher, two ways, and when you look at the Margaret Thatcher test, that's what the one on the left, the right actually looked like. Looking back, looks pretty normal upside down. Looking forward, she's a horror show. And that's because our ability to read faces relies on things when they're upright and there are distances between each other that we can't do the same when they're upside down. So we only see her monstrosity. All of this is telling me that things are not what we think and I'm hoping that you can use that in your studio sometimes even to interpret critique. Sensory remediation. So here comes fun analytical stuff. Am I way over the time? Not too bad? Okay, you can start giving me motions. I love this. This is a nose prosthetic for people who had syphilis. When you have syphilis, your nose would collapse sometimes. So um, you would need a new one. And, and then we have funny projects like this. It's a pepper mill that sneezes. It's probably made of um, rubber latex. And so our actual things in our home might be augmented. That's these, you know, some of these images are a little harsh. I'll show this briefly as to say that I find that image a little sweet, like in the last gasp, you're connecting to someone else with the only way you can connect. This guy is putting in a device that lets someone in a wheelchair guide themselves via the mouth. And there are tons of these now, so we're in a new day and age where people can function. This is Michael Burton again, accepting um, genetic or material to prevent bad bacteria by getting a bird to come close to his mouth with this seed mouth. And then, you know, the surrealists were playing with our head a lot and adding new heads. Stellark again, we'll look at him. This is the nasal ranger. If you live near a dump, you can order one of these and test the acceptability of the dilution of the smell. So the, um, we, things are getting real, like the brain port is a series of electrodes that you stick on your tongue and it has two functions. It either allows you to see because the tongue goes straight back to the visual cortex via other parts of the brain, via brain, brain plasticity, or it tells you by sensors that you're not upright for people that don't have good balance. Somebody came along called Beta Tank and made one of these um, devices to help, like if you could see through an array of electrodes, um, because the electrodes are showing you low resolution black and white, then maybe if you suck on a lollipop with electrodes, then you could see some kind of beautiful image of a fish. It wasn't real, but a lot of people tried to order it, and I love that idea that a simple lollipop can take your mind somewhere. So then the tongue, again, sensory-wise, this artist Kang Zin, Chinese, like licks his way across the world. Might gross you out, but you get used to it. And this woman, Annelise Semper, took a very simple gallery and as her video licked her way across the room. The guy that I'm um, working with in that installation, Andy Quitmeyer, here is him with a leaf on his tongue that is sensing ants in the jungle. So I'll show you a little video mm -hmm. of that. Mm. Oh, okay. So the Hi. ants. Okay. I'm going to show you our tasting ant traffic device that we've built out here in the jungle. You may have already seen uh, our earlier work trying to figure out how to solve the problem of sensing ants. We came up with a solution that works for kind of larger ants. It seems to kind of function on these chromatogaster here. They're a nice medium-sized black ant. Uh, and the way it works is you have these fiber optics that are sanded. And right when a cute little ant happens to walk over these thin little fiber optics, it changes the light that's entering these photoresistors over here. This all goes down to our Arduino 
the Arduino measures these changes in current and then it can output uh, that there's an ant detected, there's an ant going by, or a beetle, some sort of jungle traffic happening on an arbitrary surface. I'll stop that and ask you, how many of you know Arduino? Neat. Um, you, should, you should learn it. Mark, do you provide a class in that? It, it's just, to me, that would be a great tool for architects, um, for model movement, for, for light. I think that's something um, that we're not caught up in. It's heading to a weird thing. These are called, I call these absent mothers. These are photos of babies and, you know, in the old days, like Civil War photos, the camera took a real long time. So those are mothers hidden in the cloth. And this made me think, this, I think like what's hidden in architecture? Who's a hidden population? So here's a whole bunch of these weird um, hidden mothers. Also, it's a little bit about motherhood, of becoming an adult. And I think you become an absent mother when you have children and you're an architect, right? It's really hard to do everything. Anybody here agree with me? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, this is a guy who had like a, a Mexican. That's not a real thing. He had a tumor and he became part of a freak show with the idea that it was an extra head. Um, but we have freak shows all over. We have Chernobyl making a freak show of our world. And this is a great image by Jaime Pidark of a matryoshka. That's what I, I actually use this in the studio, the term to Chernobyl. When you Chernobyl things, you jam things together. And that's horrible that I actually have turned it into a verb. But I think I'm trying to connect the fact that we, we forget Chernobyl. They put a giant roof over it, like it's all okay. They said that for 50 years, that will be good, or maybe 100. So we'll all be gone when it needs a new one. But these are like massive disasters. And when I flew over the world, I, it's like you remember, oh, that's there and this is here. But the internet and how we use it keeps us from many things. Um, this, I'm gonna, I'm, Mark, you want me to be like not much more than an hour and 15 minutes. You're okay? I'm going to fly a little. This is the analytical chapter. You good? Okay. You good for me to fly through? Okay, so I'm going through the chapters in the book, and this one is ways we portray ourselves analytically for various reasons. Like at one point, we would find information in our moles or in the wrinkles of our forehead, and they told us that we were of a certain way. Then uh, Bertillon, who was a detective in France, came up with a theory of anthropometrics where they would um, check out criminals by having all kinds of measurements of ears and it was believed that they didn't replicate so if you found a criminal and you had the database of the ears you would know that it was it well of course and so these are such weird things and they all go out of date um, and what happened was there were twins and they didn't know which was which and that was not going to work so Bertillon almost also designed the first headshot speaking of people who are into mediation this is an old detective who's coming up with all these ideas. So therein starts the first headshot of himself. Uh, the fingerprint outdid anthropo anthropometrics because those twins would not be able to be, they'd be distinguishable. But um, the same guy, Bertillon, took the first overhead shot ever. And it was, of course, of a crime scene. We all see the world from above. Now with drones, we're seeing it more than ever. Um, and these are grim, again, I hate that there's grimness to this, but it's also sort of fascinating that the thing that we use commonly, seeing above, happen because of something like that. This is phrenology. At a certain point, they believed that the bumps on your head were all about what you were. So a mod of is something that um, Walt Whitman was really into and wrote about. This is sexual stuff that you're attracted to the opposite sex so you can feel that bump. But that, and they came up with books, how to read the face. So in the same, in, in this practice, you're dangerous. And how about this genuine husband? I don't know, he looks freaky. Um, moving along to, I jump from that and I'll skip that to a machine that was a phrenological machine as it moved in time and started to get disproven. Still, it was having some high techness to it. There were other things like audio phones that you'd breathe into and curling of your hair, things that connect you, machines connecting you in space uh, is what I'm looking at. And ones that measured you, like if you needed a new nose and how perfect you were, 
or that were um, analyzing your odor in a machine. And then there were outsider artists from France, Jean Pedrizé, who were drawing bodies in machines. And here's a young African artist, Kabiru, who's finding junk and making these facial devices. But then people were really the, the father and mother or whatever of, um, of virtual reality was this guy, Alphonse Schilling, who died a couple of years ago. He was an Austrian, and he came up with these two devices that you'd look and see different videos. But what I really like are his strange machines that had lenses. And these look like they're eye devices. This one is a Dunkel camera hood. This is a um, walking camera obscura. But what these devices really were is left became right, up became down, near became far. And he did not believe in like parallax. He believed in a whole other way of seeing. So I'm also saying that there are people that undermine the very fundamentals of how we see and probably believe it. So he, he um, leads to Karsten Holler and many people, the various psychologists who try to upside down glass it, which pr pretty much after two days you begin to see normally with upside down glasses. And in between it gets real wacky and you're like weirded out. But if you can see upside down, if if images are crisscrossed and upside down and then right, red right side up from your retina, then the world is a weird place. Karsten Holler made upside down mushrooms. He makes giant slides. And you, you really get messed up on those. I wrote about one. And for the writing of it, instead of looking down, I looked out. And I ended up like getting all banged up. Um, Uzumaki, again, in that world where your, your whole sky is starting to spiral, we get weirder and weirder. Tanya Blanco. This is like the future of humans will be that you have the Onco mouse, the first um, medically patented mouse that will like exist on your head and s somehow be of medical benefit. We have all kinds of ways that problems with our head are read with MRIs and, and they're cast in glass and looked at and diced. And then we have people like Charles Darwin that looked at human emotion or um, Duchenne Duboulogne who studied the relationship of the muscles to the face and actually took poor, you know, uh, it's a horrible image, I'll get away from it, um, people that could not really consent that were like in menstrual institutions and electrocuted their face to try to figure out essentially which comes first, emotion or facial muscle. And, and now they find out that, I just met a woman who had gotten Botox. If you get Botox here and you inhibit frowning, it can lead to fighting depression. And if you get Botox here, and you can't smile, then it can lead to depression. So we know now that it's a feedback loop, that if you smile, you can get happy. And uh, Daito Manabe electrocuted his friends' faces and did it to music. So I'll show you a bit of that. San, ni, ich. This guy's a Japanese VJ. He gets uh, funded by corporations to run around doing big electronic extravagances. Eventually it goes real fast. So their facial expressions are not controlled by themselves, but are to the beat. And here's the end. This is the same thing Duchenne de Boulogne <laughs> was studying. So at least we know they survived. <laughs> He does this, he can come to here and do this with you. You can all get electrocuted. Um, sensorama, oh baby, you're as cold as ice. So looking at things for the face, if you have a hangover, putting your head in ice, putting your head in the sensorama, which was a machine that did vibration, smell, everything, visual thing from the 1960s. We get uh, architects, House Rucker, who made all these head devices that are at the MoMA, and these things affect color and sensation. We saw the walking camera obscura. We have devices that have to do with um, when you tell someone tele telepathy. And we're getting done. We're in uh, alternate species. Margu Marguerite Hermo looked at um, ancient, not ancient, but defunct, now extinct animals like mammoths. And she created this wonderful project, the Mammoth Imperator. I saw it at uh, the Royal College of Art. It's like as tall as that wall and from here to mark. And it's basically recreates the soft tissue of the mammoth and the soft tissue doesn't last. So nobody really knows what it was like. And here is what a little video of it, whoops. 
I think this might be it. Oh, maybe I don't have it. Well, it's impressive. It's one of the most you walk into a gallery and all the work gets real small when you're hearing this. So um, her tutor, James Auger, decided to augment animals by giving them the ability to have night goggle visions or have spikes come up when birds came. And other people looking at species, An Anthony Hall looks at electrogenic fish communicating with them with this complex architectonic room and device and studying, you know, things the ancient Romans did. They took electrogenic fish and helped you or your various problems. Um, various devices for hearing and cyborgs and vision. I'm just going to flick through these because we see a lot of these. We saw the third arm becoming a robot, a contact lens, studied with a rabbit, eye jewelry, and strange things. And I really end here with this. This is the picture of the studio. And I think I'm almost at the end. I love the idea that you share information, that you research tons of stuff, and that you collect it all in this thought bubble that is very unknown. Another image might be that you spread it out into the world. I'm, I'm not um, super spiritual. I wish I were more so, but I like this idea. And then that you have curiosity, like Mao looking at Marcel Duchamp. I think it's fake, but the idea is that you get out of your orbit or that you see yourself sensing, this is the famous Tony Conrad having a camera photographing a camera in diagram, or that, yeah, we're not almost at the end, connect yourself to architecture, bodies and architecture, bellies and architecture. Uh, this is a sort of weird image of an installation, but it r reminds me that people can be sick and architecture can be sick. Connect to others whatever way you do, whether it's hair projects, full body drawings, just overlapping your brain, having a second head, devices by Ligia Co Clark. My co-teacher, Alan Wexler, coffee seeks its own level. Everyone has to drink it once or it spills. Um, rocks. Uh, and finally, a little project about what I did for about three years and haven't been doing as much because it's hard to do. This is a guy, Shapel Mallard. For three years, I walk, went on the subway and talked to strangers. I asked them to write a poem. And this guy I met at 10 o'clock on a weird station when it was 12 degrees, and he wrote the most beautiful poem. And so he traveled with me again, and here is one of the things he wrote when we traveled together. The weight of simple questions or the dark star gravity of tiny hands is enough to choke on and beat back the burn in your own eyes. To be black is to consider the untimely death of your children. There is no language for why a life matters. Its logic is warmth, the way one hand can curl and leaf blindly around another. A brown finger stuck in a bramble of hair, eyes, laughter squeezing the ribs, hurt so thick, it makes the day slow and heavy and wordless. What does it cost me to explain my life to you? To find acquittal for my breathing, to plead for water, to question the nature of my love and pain and hope to better answer your own. What should it cost when we pay in children? in years. Simple questions, tiny hands, enough to choke on and beat back the burn in your eyes and sometimes find yourself silent and shaking. I show you that because people are fabulous and poetry is neat too. So my first studio this semester, I assign a poem to begin the studio. These are other people's poems writing on the train. Uh, a poet here who told, wrote something weird about a name, and it turned out to be my sister's name, Julie Ann. That was the photo that inspired her poem. So weird things happen amongst me and people. I got followed around by PBS, but I won't show you that. Um, you can look it up. And I, think, I want to say thank you, um, really big thank you to Mark, my, my former TA. Brief though it was, we bonded. He's a great guy, and it's wonderful that he had me. And it seems like there's some neat people around here, and I'm really appreciative of you coming out. Mark said there, the first lecture doesn't have that many people, but this was very nice. And this is Barbara Papa's house, a com um, cartoon from France that I like a lot. Each character can morph into whatever they want to be. I wish we could do that in architecture. That's your job, is to push, to push into the future. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
see, I, I wear you out when I do my talks. I don't, I don't know why I add, like, instead of taking away 100 slides, I add 100 slides. Would you like to ask me anything? Dora. Um, thank you so much, Madeline, for this uh, breathless, wonderful, you know, uh, tour de force. Um, my question is uh, simple and yet probably really strange, um, which is uh, understanding an architecture that the Vitruvian man, who's this kind of nice self-contained circular human figure without any extra sensory apparatus, um, is the perfect fit for the primitive hut and the hut being the four posts and the, you know, and the, and the, and the tribulation. Um, is the suggestion that, that as the body expands and gains all of this, you know, prostheses and, you know, extra sensory self hoods and you know possibilities that we we as architects need to go back and revisit the kind of DNA of our primitive hut and 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 challenge that primitive hut that, that the primitive hut didn't also evolve it's funny because um, in the show I'm curating Alan Wexler does a primitive hut study he takes a, a complex branch and cuts it and puts wedges in to straighten it in fact the whole show is about that very question, what, what should we be looking at? And I, I, it's a good one. I, I don't associate entirely with that. I, I associate more with, in a way, what we should be looking at is the airline video where there was no airplane. I don't know why. I, that, to me, seemed like really related to this expansion that... I know you have to be in a room. I know you need a bedroom. I get it. But there's also some level of dissection that's going on with mentally that I can't put my finger on, but I can see it. I don't know. I'm not sure what the model will be. And I, yes, I do think we need to rethink it. Architecture can be very dopey about, you know, its precedence. And it's, it gets me like kind of, I have a little trouble sometimes walking into it and, he and hearing all the kind of definitions, but I don't know, I, I'm pleasantly surprised that people have an open mind. Is it, do you have a precedent, Mark, that we need to look at instead of the Vitruvian man? Can you take the pose of the new man that we... <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> Good question, mediocre answer. What else? Anybody else? You've got to ask me something. Yes. In the white shirt. Oh, you got the mic. Thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. When you talk about augmentation, it kind of reminds me of disabled people who are either blind or deaf. And for blind people, I think they can remap vision into volumes and it triggers a new way of seeing. And I was wondering what you think about whether that opposite of, of augmentation, that reduction, can actually open up a different way of seeing as well? Good question. There's a lot of reducing projects. There was a whole show at the Victoria and Albert about ear devices that, that filter sound. So I agree with you. The next thing that's going to be is that things get cut off, inputs, and that is happening. As well, there's a lot of people in art and technology working on um, part for the body in ways to augment senses that people don't have. And I'm I was invited to um, Denmark to a program and a couple of the teachers, that's their specialty. So I think it, it is going both ways. The, this endless bombardment is going to need filtration. And I don't know what that is. So I, don't, I don't experience it that much. In fact, I can't believe when I teach now and I go to the students, I've actually transformed. Last semester, I couldn't believe when I'd go up to their desk and they're getting text messages on their screen and this semester, I'm like, okay, whatever. Because they just, don't, nobody cares. Like, if the whole classroom's getting text messages and they don't care, I, I have to assume they think that's okay. So I'm, like, opening up. Then I'm reading them and I'm laughing. That's the, no, that's the privacy issue. I don't do that. 
Um, you had another question back there. Hello. Um, as a, 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 something that popped into my mind as you were going through your lectures, uh, as practitioners and students and teachers, we spend a lot of time focusing on sensing the architecture. But what popped in my mind, a lot of the work you're showing is about architecturing the senses. And to me, that's a really important conceptual reversal. So my question to you is, uh, do you find that reversal, is that a tactic? It's a conceptual tactic that comes up a lot, or was just that just a coincidence? That I, idea of I, reversing it as a, as a methodology to kind I of re see something. I went to someplace else while you were talking. I was hoping you were going to say architecture sensing the person. And I was like, yes, yes. That too. So I got distracted. That's, I would like to think that's, I would like that to be happening. Like the wall would adjust because of something I'm doing. But yes, that's what you said. You said, well, I think that's what I do. Um, I think the, the, la the limit for me, though I'm a licensed architect, which is kind of wacky, is that I don't do enough with it. Like I, I can, I'm preaching, I'm saying it, but I'm not sure what it means. This new leaf thing is my step back into it because it's going to have augmentation. It will probably light up when you go near it. It's all going to be interactive. And, and it's going to be architecture. It's a moving room made of these, you know, reminiscence of leaves. And I don't know. I'm, I'm on some cusp, but I don't know yet. And I know that it's easy to talk about this and harder to do it. Anybody else? Chino? That Chino was one of my students. She's now at UC Berkeley in architecture. I'm curious. Um, I mean, one emerging new technology, which we have now, is um, technologies to expand the abilities for um, non-humans, um, machines, computers, to sense with deep learning and pattern matching and um, cameras, which have image processing embedded into them. So I wonder how um, that expanding um, sensory capacity relates to augmenting human senses. Good question. Um, there's a few people that I've been talking deeply to. One is Zavin Pare. He works with robots. He, he's an uh, artist and robotics person who was sort of dismissed, he says, in like France, but in Japan he's like a superhero. And in Japan they have him like sit in a room with a robot like for for three months, he just sits with this robot and studies her. And I, I watched him give a talk, and it was pretty freaky, like his conclusions and the, the robot's behavior. So I don't, I'm not there enough, but I, I do believe, I kind of believe all of this augmentation. A little bit like all the technologists, anyone that's sort of into art, um, science and technology and computers that has the future scenario that in 30 years we'll all need to be augmented or we will fall behind these machines. And I, I don't know. I'd like to think that some people can just not augment and not be like left in the dust, but I, I, there's all those machine learning images of machines learning to draw and stuff and they're like babies right now, but I don't know. I, hopefully, we'll all keep under a little tight control with that, and it will be enjoyable and fruitful and not hideous like some people think. But I don't know, Chano, you That's a good area for you, <laughs> for architects to know about. Robotic rooms, yeah. Thanks for your questions. I, I got a little jet lag toward the end. I very much enjoyed your lecture, and Thank I you. want to share um, if you well if you could share with us um, maybe your experience where one of my students um, is thinking well this is a thesis student, and it's the aspect of smell that influences um, so it's the tactility of the earth and soil and the vegetables that are grown in China that he's very familiar with. Hmm. but he's taken on in his thesis an idea about this farming aspect. And because of tact that tactile aspect, the expansion and contraction of that smell is actually influencing his project. So I'm wondering if there's a vehicle that you can share with us just from your experience that would further inspire one of our students who's taking a, a, a smell. Step. 
Yeah. yeah. Neat. Smell is really yeah. tough. There's a f few people out there working with smell. Um, one of them, I just, one thing about smell is, what I, from what I understand in my science reading, we have smell receptors in our skin. So that's an area I'm really interested in. Sm scents that are displaced to places that you don't ordinarily think them. So your skin is smelling, but you're not conscious of your smelling. And then there's this woman, Cicel Tolas. I don't know if he knows her. She is some art and technology smell expert. And at her lecture, she passes around like, um, you know, men's underarm smell in, in vessels and all kinds of horrible things and talks about how you can train yourself to smell anything and not be grossed out. But I don't know much about farming. I only know that the vegetable project in the studio is amazing because you walk into the studio and there's like at first the delicious fresh smell and then the rotting smell and it's it's like the most wonderful part of my day so I, I would like to think that this is a good project and I don't I don't know enough though I it's hard to teach smell but anything that's hard is doable and so I, I would say go with it it'd be very easy to say don't do that it's too hard but so what? Not a good answer yet. I'd like to think about it, though. Neat project. All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, have a lovely evening and uh, go out there and do good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>